are a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, and beginning at verse 15. John 14, verse 15. Let's hear God's word. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realise that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Let's pray. Oh Lord our God, we do uh, thank you for these great promises that we have read, for the uh, greatness of your love towards us, and for the mystery of uh, that you are in your three persons, Father, Son and Spirit, and Lord we thank you for the way we have read that... uh, In all of these persons, uh, you are gracious to us. Lord, we pray that you would help us now to consider these things, to grow in our understanding. Lord, you are an an immense God, uh, far beyond our understanding. But we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. And we pray that you would sharpen our dull minds and that you would warm our hearts, that we may know you better that we may uh, grow in our love to you, and that as we know you, Lord, that we ourselves may be changed in our hearts and may be made more conformed uh, into your image and to live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, we've read that those who love you will obey your commands, and Lord, we have to confess that we fall so far short and we have to seek your forgiveness. But Lord, we say that we love you. We, we do love you and pray that you would forgive us and that you would increase our love. And we pray that uh, this meeting this evening, that you would use that as a means to the, our growth in our love to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. I think it's fair to say that evangelical Christians neglect the doctrine of the Trinity. So tonight, we hope to contribute at least to put that right. And our speaker is uh, Dan Peters, who's sitting here to my right. Dan, who no doubt is known to many of you, is the minister of Newcastle, Uh, Reformed Evangelical Church. 
And Dan was telling me over supper, you've been the minister there for 18 years, was it? Something like that. 18 years of ministry in that place. So we give thanks to God for that ministry. And we give thanks to God for his call on Dan's life. As well as ministering there, he teaches as assistant professor of practical theology and chair of homiletics at the uh, Westminster Presbyterian Theological Seminary here in Newcastle. So he is uh, well qualified to teach on this subject. And indeed, the subject of our talk tonight in our series, Solid Foundations, the Holy Trinity. Dan, very warm welcome to you. Please. Well, I'm going to begin then this evening with some texts from Scripture. It's always a good place to start. And some texts from Scripture which all mention God. So first of all, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Paul writes, There is one God. So that's clear and unequivocal, isn't it? Uh, Christianity is fiercely monotheistic. There's no religion in the world that is more monotheistic than Christianity. There is, Paul says, one God. Second text, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Paul writes, Our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. So God is mentioned again there in that text and is further identified there as Jesus Christ. Third text, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul again, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So Jesus Christ is present again in that text, but this time someone else, not Jesus Christ, bears the title God, someone called the Father. Then one more text just now, uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. You know the incident here, Ananias and Sapphira, and the way in which they have kept back money and then lied about it. And Peter then says to them, or says to Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You have not lied to men, but to God. So the God that Ananias has lied to is described neither as Jesus Christ, nor as the Father. He's described as the Holy Spirit. So what's going on here then? How do we make sense of all that data with which I've just presented you? Well, we might try to do so in this way. Well, who is, who is Dan Peters? Well, it depends. There's Dan Peters, the husband. There is Dan Peters, the father. There is Dan Peters, the pastor, and, and so on. Well, perhaps then in a similar way, in some settings, God is Jesus Christ. In some settings, God is the Father. In some settings, God is the Holy Spirit. That sounds plausible, doesn't it? Until you bring in a couple more texts. John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Galatians 4, verse 6, similarly, God has sent the Spirit into our hearts. Now think of my analogy again. Dan Peters, the husband, can't send Dan Peters, the father, somewhere. They're just two roles. One role can't send another role somewhere. I can send my daughter somewhere. I can send her to the shop to buy something because she is another person distinct from me. Persons can send each other, roles can't send each other. So let's just bring everything that we've said so far together then. And I think already we have the three basic elements of the doctrine of the Trinity. And they are there at the start of your handout. Number one, the Bible states then that there is only one God. We saw that in the first text. Number two, God is sometimes in the Bible identified as Jesus Christ, sometimes as the Father, and sometimes as the Holy Spirit. We saw that in several texts. And then number three, the Bible presents Jesus Christ, the Father, and the Spirit as fully distinct persons. They can even act upon each other, sending each other, and that kind of thing. So in those three sentences, 
you have the doctrine of the Trinity. But I guess this lecture is probably supposed to last more than four minutes. Uh, so I'll say a little bit more. And we're going to look this evening then at those three things that you can see uh, set out, those three main things you can see set out on your handout. And so first of all then, let's consider the doctrine revealed. The doctrine revealed. So the first Trinitarians then were the apostles and those who believed their message. Moses wasn't a Trinitarian. David wasn't a Trinitarian. Isaiah wasn't a Trinitarian, by which I mean they did not knowingly worship the triune God. They did, in fact, worship the triune God, of course, because God has never been anything but triune. So if they worshiped God, they did worship the triune God, but they didn't worship the triune God knowingly. And so in that sense, then, the first Trinitarians were the apostles. And the apostles only became Trinitarians. Peter and John and Thomas and the others, they weren't raised Trinitarians. They became such in adult life. And there's something fascinating about all that, which is this. We get no sense in the New Testament of them struggling with that adjustment. I mean, we see them struggling with some adjustments. The inclusion of Gentiles into the church without having to be circumcised, that was a huge struggle for them, wasn't it? And a, a whole council in Jerusalem was required in order to grapple with that issue. And we see Peter, don't we, accepting that as he has that vision but then later on wobbling on it so that Paul has to rebuke him, he tells us in the letter to the Galatians. Now, this truth that the one God is three persons, that's way bigger than the Gentiles being included in the church without having to be circumcised. And so you'd have thought if they wobbled on, on the latter, they would have wobbled on the former. And yet we don't see any evidence of that in the New Testament. And so it raises then this important question, how do those apostles so seamlessly accept the revelation of this doctrine that the one God is three persons? Well, I think there are at least two answers to that question. And first of all, then, the revelation was incidental. Now, that might, may seem a bit of an odd word to use, and I think that's because we we use the word incidental quite loosely. We often use it to mean something like unimportant. Oh, it's incidental. It's not very significant. I don't mean it in that sense. According to the dictionary, this word incidental, it has these meanings, naturally attached, accompanying, concomitant. And that's how I'm using the word then. And I'm actually borrowing it from Benjamin Warfield. And Benjamin Warfield then, the great American th theologian from the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, he writes this. He says, the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity was made not in word, but in deed. This is the same man that wrote a great volume on the inspiration and authority of Scripture. And yet he quite boldly here says, the revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity was made not in word, but indeed, he continues, the revelation was incidental to and the inevitable effect of the accomplishment of redemption. So here are these apostles then, and they are monotheistic to the core. And one day, a man called Jesus walks into their lives and calls them to follow him. And they do that. And over the next three years then, they watch Jesus live, and they watch him die, and they watch him rise again. And the evidence is just overwhelming, and it's compelling. This person is God. God the Son, sent to earth from heaven by God the Father. The last thing we see those apostles doing before Jesus goes back into heaven is what? It's worshipping him. But then, a few weeks later, those same men are hit by another great disruption to their lives. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit comes upon them. 
and the Spirit comes upon them and so transforms them and empowers them that again, it's inescapable. This person is God. God the Spirit sent to earth from heaven by God the Son. And there they have it then. They are Trinitarians now. I mean, let's think a bit of it from another angle. Suppose then that the revelation to those men of the doctrine of the Trinity, suppose it had occurred by means of an angelic lecture. The angel Gabriel had come and gathered the apostles together in a room. He distributed handouts on the seats and he'd stood at a lectern and given them a long-winded lecture as to how the one God was three persons. I think then they would have struggled with the adjustment. But you see, the revelation occurred instead in this incidental way as they observed these events unfolding before their eyes. I mean, we human beings just do adapt, don't we, to events. You think of the COVID pandemic. None of us had ever experienced a pandemic before. And in the abstract then, the idea of living through a pandemic with its effects on work and recreation and holidays and all the rest of it would have been unthinkable. But we didn't experience the pandemic in the abstract. We experienced it, experienced it as a real concrete event. And so we all just adapted to the new normal, as we called it. And that's how it was for the apostles, I'm saying. Any objection, but the one God can't possibly be three persons, that was rendered irrelevant. It was just overtaken by the fact they had account encountered in the events of salvation the one God as three persons. In the face of the incarnation and Pentecost, they just adopted, I'm saying, adapted rather, to the new normal. There was no way that they could go out into that first century world and preach salvation while holding the doctrine of the Trinity at arm's length. Because the two things were so intimately bound up with each other. In salvation, the one God they had encountered was the initiating father, the purchasing son, and the applying spirit. And so to preach that salvation was necessarily to preach the doctrine of the Trinity. And so I'm saying that's one reason then why I think they didn't struggle with this adjustment because the revelation was incidental. It accompanied the events of redemption. And then secondly, the revelation was congruous. By which I mean then it was congruous with the revelation which they already possessed in the Old Testament. Suppose I told you then that my wife is Welsh, and that was a new revelation to you. You didn't know that before. There would then be at least three possibilities. You might have heard before that my wife is French, or that I don't have a wife, in which case the new revelation, my wife is Welsh, would be entirely contradictory. It contradicts what you previously thought you knew. Then again, you might have heard before that my wife is a teacher. In which case, the new revelation, my wife is Welsh, is just unrelated. It doesn't have anything to do with your previous knowledge. And then again, you might have heard before that I studied in Wales. In which case, although you didn't know that my wife is Welsh, the new revelation is congruous. It fits your previous knowledge that you had. And the new revelation then that the one God is three persons, that these apostles encountered, I'm saying, in the events of salvation, it was like that third example. They already knew things about God. And this new revelation then, it certainly wasn't contradictory. It didn't contradict what they already knew. Nor was it unrelated to what they already knew. It was congruous with what they already knew. Now, part of what I mean there is those irregularities, if you like, that you get from time to time in the Old Testament. You get it right on the first page, don't you, of the Old Testament. God saying, let us make man. It just seems a bit strange and a bit mysterious in its context. 
Or then you have those appearances of the angel of the Lord. And it's just strange the way that sometimes the angel of the Lord speaks as though he himself is Yahweh. But other times he speaks of Yahweh as someone else in the third person. Or then you have uh, some of the messianic prophecies which are prophecies then of the Messiah that God is going to send, and yet the Messiah himself seems to be God. So Isaiah 9 will get wheeled out again in a few weeks' time. This one who is mighty God, the everlasting Father, and yet he's the Messiah. Surely the mighty God is sending him, but he is him, that passage says. Psalm 45, another messianic psalm, and yet it says... To the Messiah, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. And so there are all these irregularities then. And, and uh, those apostles then, growing up, would, would have found those odd. And wouldn't really have known probably what entirely to make of them. But then you see, those would suddenly have made sense the day they realized, through the incarnation, through Pentecost, that the one God is three persons. So part of what I mean by this congruity is that, but I mean something more than that. The Old Testament everywhere reveals a God, doesn't it, who is relational. Supremely, I suppose, the Psalms reveal a God who is relational. The, The Psalmists describe intimate communion, don't they? between themselves and God. Psalm 139, one of my favorite psalms. It's so beautiful, isn't it, for its intimacy. You have searched me. You know my goings in and my goings out. Wherever I go, you hold me by my right hand. It's so beautiful, the intimacy of it all. But you see, a God who is just one person cannot truly be relational. Fellowship and intimacy are not natural to such a God. A God like that, like Allah, can do sovereignty, but a God like that can't do communion. So I'm saying then that there's there's a kind of awkwardness in the Old Testament situation. A God who is known by the Old Testament saints as unipersonal, one person, and yet a God who at the same time is so natively relational. And the apostles then would have lived for years just with that awkwardness. And then suddenly that awkwardness disappeared the day they came to understand the one God is three persons. Then Psalm 139, a God who is so relational, then it made sense. So, you read the New Testament then, and perhaps you think to yourself sometimes, how have we gotten from the Old Testament with its undifferentiated Yahweh to this pervasively Trinitarian material in the New Testament? Where's the bridge, you're thinking? Where do we see the apostles receiving and processing and grappling with this massive new revelation? Why does it all just seem to be assumed suddenly? that God is Trinity, taken as a given by these men who had spent most of their lives with no conception that the one God is three persons. Well, hopefully these two points that we've highlighted help to explain the revelation was incidental and the revelation was congruous. And so that's the first thing then, the doctrine revealed. But then let's move on to the doctrine protected. The doctrine protected. So over... 2,000 years then, the doctrine of the Trinity has prompted the formation of some of the church's most significant creeds and has occupied the minds of some of the church's most significant theologians, giants of Western Christianity like Tertullian in the 2nd and 3rd century, Hilary in the 4th century, Augustine in the 4th and 5th centuries, much later on John Calvin in the 16th century. Giants of Eastern Christianity, like Basil and his brother Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory of Nazianzen, those three so-called Cappadocian fathers in the 4th 
century. John of Damascus in the 7th and 8th century. And these figures then, these giants, they have bequeathed us an immensely rich heritage of words and phrases and concepts relating to the Trinity. Now you might think, well, as as sola scriptura people, as Bible people, why do we need all their words and phrases and concepts? We get our doctrines from the Bible, not from the church fathers and the reformers, do we not? Well, yes, that's true. But what those men were doing is they weren't (coughs) devising or developing even the doctrine of the Trinity. They were expounding it. They were unpacking the biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Often they were doing so in the face of assaults, very serious assaults being made on the doctrine by heretics. And so they were attempting then to articulate and conceptualize the biblical doctrine of the Trinity in such a way as would best protect it from contemporary abuse. And so that's what I mean by this second main heading this evening, the doctrine protected. Now we haven't time to examine many of those words and phrases and concepts that have been handed down to us, but I'm just going to touch on four, which you can see on your handout, and which I I think are of uh, particular importance. And this is the part of the lecture then in which we need to be willing to have our minds stretched a little bit. And so first of all then, perichoresis. Perichoresis. Now that word then, that concept, it means that the three divine persons all dwell within one another. So you remember how on three occasions in John's Gospel, we have Jesus saying, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Chapter 10, verse 38, chapter 14, verse 11, chapter 17, verse 21. And it may be extrapolated then from those texts that the same could be said of the Spirit. We may infer that the Spirit also is in the Father and in the Son, and the Father and the Son are in the Spirit. This is how God is one. He's one in the sense that the three persons all dwell within one another. Each enfolds and envelops and contains the others. So you never get the Father without also getting at the same time the Son and the Spirit. Because the Son and the Spirit are in the Father. You never get the Son without at the same time getting the Father and the Spirit. Because the Father and the Spirit are in the Son. You never get the Spirit without at the same time getting the Father and the Son. Because the Father and the Son are in the Spirit. And it's very important then that we understand that this is the sense in which God is one. I have a feeling that many Christians think like this, that when we relate to God in his threeness, and we start a prayer, perhaps Father, Son, and Spirit, then we are relating to persons. Whereas when we relate to God in his oneness, and we start a prayer, O God, or O mighty God, we're then relating just to an essence or something like that. No, we are always relating to persons. We are always, always, always relating to God, relating to persons. God, as one writer puts it, is nothing other than these three persons. It's just that sometimes we may distinguish them as we view them dwelling within one another and relate to them as a plural, they, while at other times we may not distinguish them as they dwell within one another and relate to them then as a single he. And that's fine. It's appropriate to do that at times, at times not to distinguish them. It's appropriate sometimes to view God in his oneness, but I'm saying it's always persons. It's always persons. A well-known preacher came recently to an event in Newcastle and I noticed him referring to God's persons. Or in prayer, your persons, O God. As though what he was addressing in that moment was something other than the persons. This fourth thing in God, an essence. God doesn't have persons. God is persons. How is he one then? Well, he's one through this perichoresis, through the persons dwelling within one another. 
Second concept. Opera Trinitatis ad extra sunt in divisa. And those of you who know your Latin will know then that that means the external works of the Trinity are undivided. Logically, this follows from what we've just mentioned, perichoresis. And this means then, this concept, that all the divine persons are involved in every work of God. So they aren't like a rock band, where as well as being part of the band, the singer or the guitarist might go off sometimes and do his own solo project. Now, everything that any divine person does, he does in cooperation with the other divine persons. And this is important. So think of our salvation for a moment. And as evangelicals then, we love, don't we, the tight forensic logic of penal substitution. And rightly, we love it. And we perhaps might talk then in this kind of way, that you know, Christ has paid the penalty so fully that we are immune from wrath. And it would be unjust indeed if uh, we were now to experience wrath. We, we might talk like that. Uh, and that's true. But we must make sure that we never give the impression or we never indeed entertain the impression that Christ in penal substitution has kind of somehow outwitted the Father. So the Father is sort of chomping at the bit to damn us all, but Christ has cleverly stepped in and prevented it by dying on the cross. No, the opera Trinitatis ad extra sunt in divisa means that the son's atoning work is a work of the father as well. Which means that he desires our immunity from wrath as much as the son does. There's no arm twisting going on here. The father hasn't grudgingly forgiven us because the cross has forced him to do so. But the cross is the Trinity's thing. It's not just the son's thing. Everything that God does is the Trinity's thing, not just the Son's thing, the Father's thing, or the Spirit's thing. The persons always operate together. Jim Packer puts it colorfully. He says, the, tri the tritheistic fantasy of a loving Son placating an unloving Father and commandeering an apathetic Holy Spirit in order to save us is a distressing nonsense. So the concept of the three persons in every divine activity working together is very important. However, we mustn't take it to mean that all the persons are identically involved in every work of God. I mean, think of the incarnation. And the spirit, we know, is highly involved in the incarnation. That will be evident in some of those readings that we'll have at carol services in a few weeks' time. The Spirit brings about the conception, doesn't he, in, in Mary's womb. The Spirit, as theologians have put it, generally creates the human nature that the Son assumes in the Virgin's womb. But the Spirit doesn't become incarnate. Only the Son becomes incarnate. So, no, as I said a moment ago, the persons do not ever engage in solo projects, but there is room within their shared projects for a significant degree of distinct activity. So that's two concepts down. Thirdly, autotheos. And this then refers to God's self-existence. We know, don't we, it's a basic truth of our theology that God is uncreated and unsustained. There is nothing about his existence at all that is dependent upon anything or anyone else. And if, therefore, the Father is God, then he must be self-existent. He must be autotheos. Now, no one has ever disputed that. Equally, however, if the Son is God, 
And if the spirit is God, each of them must be self-existent, must be autotheos. And that's where the concept has needed to be insisted upon. Because there's always been then this stubborn, difficult to remove notion within Christ- Orthodox Christianity that deity properly belongs to the Father. And the Son's deity then and the Spirit's deity are in some way derived from Him. And especially the Son's deity. Because, of course, to our human minds, the very fact that he's the son suggests derivation, doesn't it? Human sons owe their existence to their parents. Presumably then God the son owes his existence to God the father. That seems to be what the Nicene Creed is getting at. In that well-known phrase, very God of very God. John Murray writes concerning that expression. He says that it's no doubt repeated by orthodox people without any thought of suggesting what the evidence derived from the writings of the Nicene Fathers would indicate the intent to have been. This evidence shows that the meaning intended is that the Son derived his deity from the Father and that the Son was not therefore autotheos. It was precisely this position that Calvin controverted with vigor. And Calvin then usually is, and rightly is, heralded as the champion of this concept, autotheos. He argued that if that Nicene statement is correct, very God of very, of very God, then Jesus isn't God. Because to be God is to be self-existent. There can be no of. You can't be of someone if you are God, because necessarily to be God is to be underived. There's no gradation, you see, of no gradation of deity among the persons. Don't think woodpeckers. There's a great spotted woodpecker, and then there's a lesser spotted woodpecker. We don't have one divine person who's great and then two that are lesser. This, their equality is absolute. That's why... I think in New Testament texts which mention all three persons, the order in which they're mentioned doesn't seem to be all that important. Again, Benjamin Warfield comments on this, and he says of it, the question naturally suggests itself whether the order, Father, Son, Spirit, was especially significant to Paul and his fellow writers of the New Testament. If in their conviction the very essence of the doctrine of the Trinity was embodied in this order... Should we not anticipate that there should appear in their, that that should appear in their numerous allusions to the Trinity? But no, we have different order, a different order to the persons in different New Testament texts, and so this was this is such an important concept. It seems that it took until Calvin in the 16th century to really shake off those last residual elements of derivation and origination being involved between the persons of the Godhead. But there can be no derivation, as he so rightly argued. There can be no origination. To be God is to be self-existent, and that must be true, therefore, of the Father, of the Spirit, of the Son. And then one more concept, then, the imminent trinity and the economic trinity. Now, don't worry, there aren't really two trinities. You might be thinking that the maths is getting very complicated now. Rather, when theologians have spoken of the imminent trinity, they mean the trinity as it simply is, in its eternal, intrinsic existence, without any reference then to creation, without any reference to anything outside of itself. That's what theologians mean by the imminent trinity. The economic trinity, on the other hand, is the trinity doing things outside of itself, namely creating and redeeming, especially. Now, it's an important distinction, I think, uh, important to keep the two clearly distinguished. 
Uh, we mustn't put ourselves at the center of everything and forget that God does have an eternal, intrinsic existence. He freely chose to create and redeem. He never had to do those things. He was complete without creating and redeeming. And had he never created or redeemed, he would have remained complete. Creating and redeeming don't add anything to him. They don't help him to fulfill the terms of his existence somehow. God has this this intrinsic, eternal existence quite apart from any works that he has ever done. So So it is an important thing to distinguish between the imminent and the economic. But the other crucial, crucial thing to be said is that the economic trinity then is consistent with the imminent trinity. In other words, when God does freely decide to create and to redeem, he does it in a way that is true to himself, true to who he eternally is. He doesn't reinvent himself as he creates and as he redeems. He doesn't put on a public appearance that is different somehow to his real, eternal, essential identity. And this is crucial then, because actually, if the economic trinity, that is the trinity that we see in creation and in redemption especially, if that trinity can't be relied upon as a genuine revelation of God, then he might not actually be a trinity at all for all we know. Because remember I said at the start in my first point that we know God is a trinity through the events of redemption. Well, what if in redemption God just arbitrarily decided to act as three persons even though that's not really who he is? I'm saying we're dependent. We're absolutely dependent on this idea that the economic trinity is consistent with the imminent trinity. But if it's true then that consistency it has far-reaching implications because it means then that how the Father acts in redemption tells us eternal things about the Father. And how the Son acts in redemption tells us eternal things about the Son. And how the Spirit acts in redemption tells us eternal things about the Spirit. These aren't random Allocations, they didn't go eeny, meeny, miny, mo. you do that, son, you do that, spirit, I'll do this. But the way they act in redemption are windows into their truest and most essential and eternal identity. Hannah, my wife, and I once went to a dog sledding event in Aviemore. I'm not sure why we did that, but we did. It was many years ago. And there was a guy that I don't know very well, but I know him a little. And he knew that we went to this, and he kind of latched onto this. And I see him now about every five years, and he kind of asks me, are you still into dog sledding? And I have to explain, well, I was never actually into dog sledding. We just kind of randomly went to this thing. Well, the person's redemptive roles are not like that. Not these random things. The son randomly doing what he did. The father randomly doing what he did. The spirit randomly doing what he did. But there's a consistency between the economic trinity, how they act in redemption, and the imminent trinity, how the trinity actually, eternally is. You see, often when the question has been asked, how are the three persons distinct from each other? The answer, as some of you will know, has been given, well, The Son is begotten, and the Spirit proceeds, and the Father is neither begotten nor proceeds. Which sounds great, until you reflect on it for a couple of minutes, and it doesn't really tell you all that much, does it? Gerald Bray, who I remember hearing at a Christian Institute lecture when I first came to Newcastle, an excellent lecture he gave, he writes in his book on the doctrine of God on this and he says the Cappadocians that was those men that we mentioned earlier Basil and the two Gregories they tended to make abstractions of words like begotten and proceeding 
therefore revealing a mental outlook basically foreign to that of Scripture. They turned relationships into attributes and so invented qualities which do not exist. There is no such thing as unbegottenness. It is a category of thought which, which does not correspond to any observed reality. And Robert Lethem then, whose book is um, commended on the back of your handout, I think it's the best book to have been written on the Trinity probably in the last 50 or more years. It's an excellent read. It's not a light read, but it's an excellent read. And he writes then, very boldly, he says, it is often said that the only distinction of the persons is the ineffable eternal generation and procession. This is not so. Only the Son became incarnate, not the Father or the Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, not the Son or the Father. Only the Father, not the Holy Spirit, sent the Son. And Latham there then is assuming this point I'm making that there is a consistency between the imminent trinity and the economic trinity. And therefore the distinctions that we see as God works out redemption, those are profound distinctions and distinctions that we can incorporate into our very view of the trinity. So the doctrine revealed... The doctrine protected. But then thirdly and finally this evening, the doctrine embraced. The doctrine embraced. And this is where we often fail, isn't it? So we confine the doctrine of the Trinity to the realms of theology and perhaps apologetics. But we don't embrace the doctrine of the Trinity. It doesn't make a difference really to our Christianity, and yet it should. And in connection with embracing it then, just three quick points. First of all, the sublime excellency to be contemplated. Peter talks, doesn't he, about the excellencies of God, 1 Peter 2, verse 9, a lovely phrase. Well, God's triune shape, if we may use that word, is an excellency. It's sublime. It's beautiful. I mentioned earlier how as evangelicals we like uh, the, the tight forensic logic of penal substitution. And I guess we, we like tight logic generally as evangelicals. And that's a good thing. But we must always beware of becoming rationalists who are averse to mystery and who don't like mystery and who recoil from mystery. And mystery frustrates us because we want everything to be comprehensively analyzable. No, we, we must be able to, to enjoy and marvel at mystery. We must be able to cry with the Apostle Paul, oh, the depths. I mean, some mysteries, of course, are frustrating. There, there, there are different categories of mysteries. Some mysteries are frustrating. Think of crimes, Madeleine McCann. We still don't know after all these years what happened to the poor girl. And that's frustrating and disturbing that that's a mystery. But other mysteries are wonderful. Other mysteries cause us to go, wow. Think of... Uh, these David Attenborough programs and from time to time he'll talk about some phenomenon in the natural world and he'll say nobody knows why this creature does that and you go wow and it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end but nobody knows what's going on here even though we're so clever as human beings we think there's a mystery involved some mysteries are beautiful aren't they and the trinity then is absolutely a mystery absolutely a mystery it always will be a mystery but it's of the kind to be enjoyed and marveled at. I mentioned Gregory of Nazianzen, and he famously talked about his own enjoyment of the Trinity. And he said, no sooner do I conceive of the one than I am illumined by the splendor of the three. No sooner do I distinguish them than I am carried back to the one 
And he was talking about just the way in which he would gaze upon the triune God. And sometimes he would see God in his oneness, the three persons mutually indwelling each other. But then other times he would distinguish them and think about the Father, think about the Son, think about the Spirit. And there's just this constant kind of oscillation going on as he enjoyed his triune God. We read, or had read to us earlier, those verses in John 14. And there, just you know, one person comes into view. The Spirit was mentioned first, wasn't he? Of course, it's Jesus who's speaking. But then the Spirit fades from view, and he talks about the Son and the Father coming and making their home in the believer. And then at the end of that passage, the Spirit came into view again. And again, this beautiful interplay and oscillation between the persons. I mean, imagine having a God who was just this dull monad. A single person existing in consummate boredom. Having to create something just to amuse himself. It would be awful. Our God is infinitely superior. And so I'm saying contemplate him. Contemplate this triune God. And enjoy, enjoy the spectacle. So the sublime excellency to be contemplated. Secondly, the relational possibilities to be grasped. The whole goal of our redemption is being brought to God, isn't it? That's what Peter, again, Peter says in 1 Peter 3.18. We've been brought to God. That's why Christ died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. So the goal of our redemption is a relationship. But because then God is Trinity, we've been seeing tonight, the relationship into which our redemption has brought us is a relationship with three strands to it. We can cultivate a relationship with each of the persons. We can bask in the love of each of the persons. It's like a, a child growing up in a, a healthy home. He knows that both his parents love him. And it's not that one parent loves him any more than the other does, but they both love him in their own way. There's a, a distinctive flavor to the father's love and a distinctive flavor to the mother's love. No difference in degree, no difference in intensity but just a difference that reflects they are different persons. And we are loved by the Father maximally. And we are loved by the Son maximally. And we are loved by the Spirit maximally. But we are loved in ways that reflect who each of them is. And the Father's love is not exactly the same as the Son's love. And not exactly the same as the Spirit's love. And we can pray then to each person. We can pray to each person. Now, I, I deliberately use that word possibilities there. I, I don't want to make this some kind of legalistic, mathematical thing that, you know, a third of your prayers should be to the Father, a third of your prayers to the Son, a third of your prayers to the Spirit. That would be ridiculous. And we should never impose too many rules on prayer because it can then cease to be the devotional heart reality that prayer is supposed to be. But I think that as we mature as Christians, it does greatly enrich our praying when we are praying to each of the persons. So I would encourage it rather than sort of read the riot act about it. John Owen's book is the other one mentioned, I think, on the handouts. And I think it's the, the little banner paperback, a bridge version possibly of um, his Communion with God, it's in volume two of the collected works and all the Puritans pretty much wrote about communion with God. It was, it was just the theme that you wrote about if you were a Puritan, but nobody wrote about communion with God like John Owen did. John Owen approaches it from this explicitly, overtly Trinitarian perspective. What is our communion with the Father? What is our communion with the Son? What is our communion with the Spirit? And in each of those, he encourages praying to these persons and cultivate, cultivating a relationship with each of them. I encourage you to read that and I encourage you more to do it. And then one more thing in the embracing 
of the doctrine, the liturgical principle to be adopted. We, we all have liturgies, whether we think we do or not. Uh, we, we all, and we all have certain principles then that inform our public worship, our liturgies. Um, it must only be must only comprise those components that are commanded in Scripture. That's a principle, of course. The singing must only be psalms. That might be a principle in your church. The evening service must involve an evangelistic appeal. There are different principles that may inform our liturgies, but how about this? It must be Trinitarian. It must be Trinitarian. This ought to be a central liturgical principle in our churches, that our worship, our Lord's Day, public worship, it must be, it must be Trinitarian. And and I guess I'm addressing especially then those of you who have responsibility for leading public worship. It must be Trinitarian. When I was an assistant minister many years ago, um, after I'd led a service, someone uh, made a gentle complaint to the minister Uh, that the Holy Spirit hadn't been mentioned in the service. I'm not sure whether that was correct or not, but I'm uh, forever thankful that that uh, complaint was made because it's haunted me and it certainly has never happened since then. And it shouldn't happen that the Holy Spirit is omitted, or the Son, or the Father, because we are Trinitarians, And our worship, therefore, should be pervasively, pervasively Trinitarian. It seems to me that the great threat to the doctrine of the Trinity within our evangelical churches is not so much now from heretical movements with labels. It's more just from liturgical sloppiness, whereby... A Unitarian could probably sit in many of our services quite happily. Walk in, walk out again, not feeling particularly disturbed by the worship service that he's been part of. Services in which the prayers just simply address Lord. Lord. Now there's no problem with that in and of itself. And of course it's a biblical term of address. And the person then who's praying in that way may mean the Lord Jesus, and that's fine. Or the person may mean the one Lord, the one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. That's fine. I said earlier, we don't always have to distinguish the persons. But I suspect often neither he nor the congregation really has a very clear idea, actually, who is meant. It's just Lord, 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 and Not really much thought as to whether we mean the Lord Jesus, whether we mean the one Lord who is Father, Son, and Spirit, or whether it's just this kind of divine essence floating around up there in heaven. We are Trinitarians, and that should shape then our personal, private communion with God, as we've said, those relational possibilities, but certainly, emphatically, It should shape our liturgies, our public worship. We come together Sunday by Sunday to worship the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Dan, thank you very much. You're not quite going to be able to go and sit down quite yet. Um, First of all, a huge thank you uh, for that talk, I was just reflecting as you were speaking how helpful your distinctions were between the doctrine revealed, uh, the doctrine protected, and the doctrine uh, embraced. And it was a great place to finish to recognize that need to not just have a theological understanding of the Trinity, for it to, for it to affect our Christian uh, life, uh, worship, and witness. Of course, many of the Heresies of the early church were all related to uh, misinterpretations or distortions of the doctrine of the Trinity. And I think probably uh, one of the major fault lines in modern British evangelicalism uh, 
is that we have again divided the persons uh, of the Trinity. So, Dan, thank you uh, for that. Uh, we have an opportunity for questions. Yes, we've got a question here. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. I was struck by your comments about the early apostles um, and their exposure to the Trinity being both incidental and congruous, but I... Following that, there were three to four hundred years of massive fighting about the nature of the Trinity. And I want to ask you whether that was due to ignorance, uh, high-handed uh, heresy, or the lack of certain things that you just described that the apostles were blessed with, the immediate apostles were blessed with. I wonder what your thoughts were on that. I think um, that possibly the kind of organic nature of the revelation of the Trinity um, didn't suit the early church and hasn't suited us in many ways in the sense that we like to systematize and we, we like the systematic theology textbook approach and we would probably, if we were honest, many of us prefer it if God had revealed the Trinity uh, in that way and that we could just, you know, look at the index in the back of our Bibles, find Trinity and go to the right pages and, um, and then it'd be in bullet points for us. And I think um, the very fact then that um, this truth is not revealed in that way but revealed in a much more organic way, um, that probably um, didn't suit the, um, the early church and was the cause of, of some of the battles at least, but it's, um, I'm sure there's much more that could be said to that, but that's the um, one thing that immediately strikes me. Mm. Thank you. The excellency of the Trinity, doesn't that truly astonish when we consider a Christian's union with God? That's right, and that was striking, in, again, in the passage that was read to us, wasn't it, that uh, Jesus there says that um, that I am in you, he says that to the Father, and um, they are in me, he says. Um, so he does there quite explicitly draw an analogy between the relationship um, between himself and the Father and that between us and him, which is quite an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Yep, one over there. The, uh, the early apostles were all uh, Jewish, and uh, the Jewish people have a, uh, that Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And uh, in the Hebrew Bible, the name for God is Elohim. It's a plur plural, plurality. So it would be easy for the, the apostles to accept uh, this revelation of the plurality of God uh, when now they understood like Jesus and then Peter was able to use that in court and Joel which you know could bring together the Father, the Son uh, and the Spirit and it just all made sense for them. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good point about the name Elohim and again that would have seemed strange to them. Why, why was this name uh, this uh, word plural um, and I think that was another of those irregularities like the ones that I mentioned um, and it's um, it's interesting as well of course that um, we know don't we throughout the old covenant period the people of Israel were often tempted to idolatry and idol worship and um, I think probably um, as well as the Trinity needing to be revealed through, through those events of the Incarnation and Pentecost. Um, Warfield and others have suggested that it might not have been safe for God to have revealed this truth earlier when they were so inclined to worship other gods and therefore the truth of the Trinity might well have drawn them in a sort of tritheistic direction to worship uh, Father, Son and Spirit as separate deities. Whereas, of course, we know, don't we, that the exile kind of hammered that... Um, idolatrous tendency or that polytheistic tendency out of Israel and so by the time of the incarnation it was safe for God to reveal to them um, the threeness within his being. Daniel. Thanks Dan. Um, I was struck uh, when you talked about the, the doctrine of autotheos that, that Calvin spoke of and how it makes it a little bit harder 
perhaps to, to understand exactly what the divine taxes means, that the Son is begotten of the Father and that the Spirit proceeds from the Father of the Son. And then I was reflecting on, you know, you talked about synergy between the imminent trinity and the economic trinity. And if there's very little we can say about what the sort of relationships, um, the begottenness and the proceeding means, how do we, how do we um, make those connections between the imminent trinity and the, the economic trinity? And so is there a little bit more that we can say about the sort of internal um, relations within the, within the trinity? Um, yeah, we, well certainly um, we, I think in, in the filial relationship that Christ has with the Father on earth, um, I think um, we can read um, quite a bit of that back into the imminent trinity. You know, that's been a controversial um, matter in recent years, um, and you know, the language of um, ontological subordination and that kind of thing, um, which I think is, is probably unhelpful language, but I think some of the things that Jesus seems to say in the Gospels about um, in a, uh, the Son doing the things that he sees the Father doing, um, I think it is probably safe to read those back into the imminent trinity and see that there was always between the Father and the Son, there is essentially between the Father and Son a, rela a, a relationship of um, deference, a relationship of the Son being led by the Father. Um, <clears throat> so um, as, as to the actual begottenness, I'm, you know, as, as Gerald Bray says, I think it's, it's hard really to put any content and any meaning into that, but the, the son, the, the father-son relationship, I think uh, we can uh, find traces in the Gospels of what that was like eternally and imminently. Thank you, and there's a question at the back there. Yeah. Um, I think I'm right in saying that David said, do not take your Holy Spirit from me in the Old Testament. In Psalm 51? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, what does that mean? in terms of the Trinity in David's day yeah. for him? Yeah, that's a really good question. Obviously, the, the Holy Spirit is, is mentioned uh, often in the Old Testament, and so it's a very interesting question. What did the Old Testament saints think that meant? Um, I would say probably the reference there in Psalm 51 seems to be the closest that we ever get to the Holy Spirit being treated by an Old Testament saint as a person. Um, but I'm not sure that by itself it affords sufficient evidence that you know, David did see him in, a, in fully personal terms. Um, I, I suspect that um, an Old Testament saint would have said that um, the spirit was the one God in his kind of um, action, his activity on earth. Um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that David would have been able to articulate that this was a person, in, or at least in the way that we, we think of person. Um, but, but yeah, certainly it's one of those places where the doctrine of the Trinity seems to get particularly close to the surface. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. I I, I'm just wondering um, how we are meant to understand the use of the terms father and son. Um, I, I'd feel very uncomfortable with anyone saying that's just an allegory, that's, that, that, or, or that's just a sort of analogous from human relationships. It seems to be treated in scripture as more than that. And yet mm -hmm. clearly, we're not talking about father and son in, in the way we, we talk about human father and son. So how should we understand those terms um, and, and how should we understand the Trinity in the light of that? Where, where do they sit between analogy and just the plain meaning as you would for humans? Which just seems that both are wrong. But. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I, I suppose um, we have this tendency, don't we, to, again, as I mentioned in a different context in the lecture, to put ourselves at the centre of everything and to read you know, from us into God, whereas it obviously should be the other way around. 
and um, our um, sonship, our parent-son relationship is just a very faint reflection of the real thing. And in order for us to approximate at all to it, we have to have derivation and origination, as I said in the lecture. Um, whereas it's not that there's something deficient in the divine sonship that he is not derived from the Father. That's the real thing. It's a deficiency in us that we have to have derivation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the other, the other thing to say, and Warfield makes this point, um, that although you're right, I mean, we should certainly never dismiss um, the, 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 father, the fatherhood and the sonship as analogy. Um, they, the Trinity is often um, presented in the New Testament without the Father being called the Father and the Son being called the Son. So you know, God and Lord are Paul's preferred designations um, for the Father and the Son, respectively. Um, it seems to be a, a particularly Johannine thing. Um, to, in, in John's Gospel, Jesus especially talks a lot about himself as the Son and the Father as the Father. But as I say, Paul is, is equally at home with the designations God and Lord. So um, I guess we mustn't absolutize um, father and son, as though that's the only way in which the Trinitarian relations can be described. For more great content, like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.